I'm going to uh, thank you for being here and being on time. And uh, what I'd like to do is begin together with you and share something for me that has been very special, very important, uh, very touching for me almost all my life. And tonight I want to share it with you in a way that is as a friend would share something. I'm not here to lecture. I'm not here to posture as if I am a, an expert and say that I know it all, because I don't. I've read, I've studied, I've tried to put inside of this little container as much as I can about the shroud. But I, t I come tonight trying as much as I can to say, here's something that's interesting for me. I want to as objectively and as fairly and as balanced a manner as I possibly can share it with you and give you the freedom to say, Father, what about this? Or what about that? Or to object and say, it doesn't make sense because, or can't be true because. So this is a back and forth. And the more you respond like that with me, the more comfortable I am. So please enjoy, I hope. I want to begin by saying something that I don't think I have said before in another Shroud presentation. But I, it makes this night for me more special than any other time I've shared it. And it's this. And again, I, I pass on to you what I've read, so I hope this is, this is accurate. In the Jewish tradition and calendar, Passover was to be celebrated after the first full moon, I believe, of the spring equinox that can pass back and forth. The 14th of Nisan, which is a Jewish month. After that, that was supposed to be the time for the, for the preparation of the lamb and then the Passover meal. Scholars have said, we know that's when the Passover occurs on this particular day of their particular month, and we know that it happened in Jesus' time on a Friday, that when Jesus was on the cross, the Paschal lambs were in the temple being slain in preparation. That's what St. John's Gospel says. So the scholars said, let's go back in our studies in scholarship and say, when was the first Good Friday? There is one Friday that seems to fall within the loop or the range of times that happen to be a Friday that would be appropriate for, for, uh, for us. <clears throat> it happens to be Friday in the, the year A.D. 30. And that particular Friday was on April 7th. That's today. Today. When we talk about tonight the shroud and the cloth that may have been around his body when he was in the tomb, if we had a time machine and had to go back and find him on the cross offering his life for us, what day would we go to? Probably, almost certainly, April 7th, the 30 AD. And tonight was the night that Jesus' body was in the tomb, the anniversary of the first real Good Friday, perhaps. So tonight, with a little bit of shivers, I share that with you. There does exist tonight in the city of Turin, a very ancient cloth. It is about 14 feet long and three and a half feet wide. It is very old, and there is a legend, a story attached to it. And the legend says, the story says, the report says, this is the actual cloth that was used to wrap Jesus' body on Good Friday and that he was in the tomb in it, and on Easter, he left it, and without us knowing how, it was saved, preserved, passed on from one person to another, from one generation to another, down through the centuries, down through the eras, and it's in Turin today, tonight, right now. That is the story, that this is 
the real cloth that was around Jesus. Now that would be interesting, but there's more to it. On the cloth, if we had it here this evening, and we could just unroll it and look, we would see that on the cloth there are stains and marks that resemble a human person, human body. And doctors and scientists have studied it. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, but I pass on what many, many, many people have said when they've studied it and examined it, that they say that almost certainly that this is not a painted artifact. It's not made by somebody. There's no paint on the cloth, no dye on the cloth, no stain on the cloth, that could have been put there by human technology or ingenuity. It's not the work of an artist. That the medical evidence is so overwhelming that this was produced by a real body, that it's those who have studied it are convinced that this was caused by a man's body. Now they can go on and say there's more to it than that. We can say with some conviction what happened to him. Now this is, his name is for now, we just put a question mark. They say someone was really buried in here and his body left the marks and impressions of itself in the cloth. He did not die, they say, a natural death. He did not die a natural death. That he was murdered and one most foul, and cruelest, the most inhuman ways for humans to hurt each other ever, and that was he was crucified. There is clear evidence of crucifixion on his body. Later when I show you the slides, you'll be able to see where the nails went through his, uh, his hands or upper wrist area. Something was put on top of his head as a torture device that punctured his scalp in any number of places and uh, bled profusely a crown of thorns. He was whipped brutally by a particular type of whip that is uniquely Roman. It's called a flagrum. And it leaves its own, and I will say this uh, with a quote, its own signature to identify what caused the wound. The Roman flagrum was not like a bullwhip like we might think. It was a short piece of wood, think of a little baseball bat. And at the end of the wood, there was three strips of leather. And at the tip, they would put two lead weights that were attached to each other and sometimes had a type of a, like spiky, pointy things on it. So each stroke of the whip would inflict um, six of these wounds. And we see evidence of that flagrum type wound all over the man's back, all the way down to his ankles. He was put on the cross, but after he had to carry it apparently, there are abrasions across his shoulders. A lot of times, in fact, our own stations show Jesus carrying the cross in that traditional way where he kind of drags the back end on the ground behind him. And uh, the Roman technique for crucifixion almost always was to have the vertical portion already at the execution site. The condemned criminal had the wooden crossbeam attached to him by straps or ropes, and he would have to carry it like this. And on this man's shoulders, there are abrasions where the wood dug into his flesh and left um, a bloody, uh, wounded skin area. He apparently fell several times. His knees are badly damaged. After he was at the, the cross site, he was nailed and left to die. And there is evidence of rigor mortis. His body in the tomb still has the posture of having died with your arms extended, your chest raised, 
and then brought down, his chest is unnaturally expanded. So those who would say, Jesus didn't die, this says otherwise. After he was dead, <clears throat> again, in the Bible, John's Gospel, one of the soldiers walks up to Jesus after he was dead, and takes a spear, and shoves it into his, his chest. This man has a clear wound in his chest, where blood and a type of watery serum fluid flowed out of his chest cavity. That's visible. There is, among many people who have studied, a deep conviction, as difficult as it might seem at first, a deep conviction that today we really have something that's real, incredible, that was around Jesus, that lets us see him. See his wounds, see his face, to really see what he looked like. I think of it as a gift, a profound gift from him to our generation. Before the invention of photography, the shroud was just a little curiosity off in the corner of a little church in the city in Italy that no one ever really knew much about. Now with photography, the whole world can see this. It is my personal feeling that this is important. And I'd like you to see it tonight. Now I want to say a little bit now that may be too technical, but here goes. I began doing this slide program as far back as 1974. That's 21 years. When I came to St. Mary's, with all the things about being the pastor here, I just didn't do it for the first couple of years. In 1988, I heard something on the news and in the paper and it says, well, I'm not going to do this now. I won't show the shroud slides. I heard, and I'm sure you've heard of this too, that there was a report of carbon dating, that the shroud had dated, been dated by carbon-14 back to the year years. The span was approximately 1290 to 1400 A.D. Now, if that's accurate, then this has nothing to do with Jesus. It's mysterious, it's strange, it's, it's, uh, it's almost more of a mystery then than it would be otherwise, but it's not Jesus, if that, accurate, if that dating is accurate. So, because I really want to be a man of some integrity, I wouldn't show this without saying, whoops, because I myself had questions and doubts now, I just didn't do it until about a year or so ago. And I began to read that there are, again, some serious scientists who have argued with some conviction and some science behind them that the carbon dating itself may be flawed. Now, I'm going to explain a little bit of carbon dating and how it works. This is the technical part, so you've got to bear with me. Everything alive has carbon. That's just the way we are. That's part of our building block. Carbon is normally carbon-12. There is a kind of rare type of carbon called carbon-14 that is mildly, <clears throat> very mildly radioactive, which means that the nucleus is essentially unstable. It doesn't want to stay at 14. It wants to get back to 12. So over a period of time, the nuclei of a whole pile of carbon-14 are going to go once in a while, boop, and become something else. It will deteriorate into something other than carbon-14. Now, among living animals, trees, gerbils, parakeets, people, um, the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14 is stable. Okay? You eat some, you give out some. You know, it just kind of stays within a certain balance. But when a person dies, or an animal dies, or flax, which makes, is the stuff you make linen from, is cut, the ratio begins to change. The carbon-14 begins to deteriorate, and a proportion of 12 to 14 increases. Okay? OK? 
kind of, sort of. This is my, I used this image last year and I'll pretend it worked. <laughs> Think of a, like a stainless steel barrel and I've got it marked inch by inch by inch all the way to the bottom <clears throat> and, I, and I fill it with water and there's a little spigot on the outside and it allows the water to dribble out one inch an hour. Okay, if I fill it up and come back later and see that it's down 20 inches, I can conclude that I've been gone how long? 20 hours, fair. So you take something that's dead and you see it's down 20 inches, 20 centuries. You can say that's how long it's been dead. Okay, now essentially what carbon-14 does is just measures the leaking of carbon-14 away. But what happens if I put it in and I come back 20 hours later, but in the in-between time, somebody has taken a can of Coke and dumped it in. Blah, 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 blah. And I look and I say, ah, eight inches, eight hours of dribble, okay. That new fluid was added somewhere in there. Well, the argument is this. In the 1532, the straw was in a church in Chambéry in France, and the church caught fire, and the shroud was almost destroyed. It was in a little silver box, folded up, and the silver became so hot it started to melt. And actually, the shroud is scarred with, with scorch marks and burn holes from that fire. They estimate that silver was burning and melting at about 900 degrees Celsius, and I think it's about at least 1800 Fahrenheit or close to it, 15. That's an extraordinarily high temperature. When they douse it with water, there was a chemical reaction. And that new carbon from the air could have been physically bonded to the old carbon, like the can of pop, blah, 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 blah. More carbon in it that was new. And when they tested it in 1988, they didn't know about that and got a false reading. Okay? Now, I'm not saying the carbon-14 is wrong. I'm saying good people, smart people, physicists, PhDs who do this sort of stuff say this is likely um, an inaccurate conclusion. And because of that, I fell free with an explanation. I hope, honest, to share it again with you. So that's what the carbon-14 is about. Now what I want to do is, is kind of step back and say, I'd like the shroud itself to show itself to you. I'm going to be quiet a little bit and then just turn off the lights and let the slides speak for themselves. Um, <clears throat> but before I do that, I want to sort of set the stage. In, in John's Gospel, after Jesus was in the tomb and dead, he rose. And he came back to the upper room and appeared to the apostles. And all of them were there except Thomas. I always tease and say, no one really knows this, but he was at Kmart. <laughs> anyway, Thomas comes back and all the apostles are excited and thrilled and ecstatic and overjoyed and almost irrationally happy. We've seen him. He's alive. He really is back from the dead. The women were right. Uh, and Thomas said, you're crazy. You're all crazy. Every one of you. When you're dead, you stay dead. And when you're crucified, you do not come back and talk about it. I will not believe this story until I can see his face and see his wounds and see his hands and see his side and touch him. I won't believe until I can see him. And then according to the gospel, a few days later, Jesus returns and Thomas is there. And Thomas is thunderstruck and says, my Lord and my God. Now my question for you tonight is this. We live in a tough age. 
where it's really challenging to believe. A lot of people will make fun of that and say, when you're dead, you're dead. And when you're crucified, you do not come back and talk about it. They will make fun of faith in fun of Christ in fun of Christians. It's a tough age. It's easy to doubt. And that's okay. It's human. <clears throat> but my point is now, if Jesus would say, I will come back and show myself to one man named Thomas because he struggled to believe, if I could do that for him, would I do it for you? Tonight, April 7th, 1995, would he love you that much? To say if you've ever wondered, if you've ever questioned, if you've ever thought, I wonder if it's true, it's okay. Everyone does. Here is a little support in your journey towards heaven. A reminder from him to you that you're okay and that you're not a fool to believe or commit your life to him. Tonight, it is my deepest conviction you're going to see Jesus Christ. A miracle is real and as important as any miracle ever. You're going to see him. At least that's my conviction. I'm not trying to tell you what you believe when you walk away, but I want you to ask this question. If Jesus would show himself to Thomas, would he show himself to us? Perhaps you are tonight going to see him. Okay, now I'm going to bring the lights down. <clears throat> the shroud. Oh, I should explain this too. Um, some people say, well, when were you there to take these pictures? And the answer is never. I, um, I own a 35 millimeter camera. I've got books on the shroud. I simply said, I wonder if I could just take pictures of the pictures, convert them from book pictures into slide pictures and just use it for programs like this. So that's how I've done it. These are pictures I've gotten <clears throat> mostly from uh, books and articles on the shroud. So I'm gonna get down. Where is the shroud now? In, in Turin, in Italy, right. And that's why they call it the Shroud of Turin. Okay, now, this is not Turin. <laughs> I don't know if you recognize it, but that's the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. I was down there a few years ago for a class trip, and in, in you know, because people wonder, how can the shroud be around 2,000 years? You, you know, it's, the cloth would be dust and rotted away by now. I saw a display of Egyptian linen that they know its origin, its date. And I took a picture of it, and I show it to you now to kind of give us a sense of how tough linen really is. Now that print is small for a lot of you, but I'm gonna read it. It says, Egyptian linen, 4,120 years old, give or take 60 years. It was, I assume it's still there, at the Museum of Science and Industry in an exhibit, and all they've got to protect it is to put it under kind of a plastic bubble so that people just can't touch it but they're doing nothing special to preserve it. And this was hard for me to believe until I began to read, but apparently museums and uh, other uh, institutions around the world have Egyptian linen and linen from other places that go back thousands of years. That it is not unusual or freakish or a miracle of any way to have a shroud around Jesus to have survived. If, if it was kept away from the extraordinary dangers like fire, it would be okay. Now this is the other major museum in Chicago, the Museum of Natural History, Field Museum. They have an Egyptian section in the basement. 
And I also saw something there that I thought was interesting, so I took a picture of it. It's a shroud, um, just an ordinary painted linen shroud from Egypt. And they've got it hanging on a wall behind a glass display case. And I will read, I hope, the small print for you. It's painted linen shroud from Egypt, Greco-Roman period, and then this next line, probably not earlier than 3rd century B.C. Now what's, again, a, a jolt for our culture when everything we have that's 10 years old is, you know, thrown away. It is not unusual at all to find linens and artifacts like that from ancient times that have survived to our time. And I just took these two pictures and put them in my program to help us realize that Jesus' shroud could easily survive to our time and be in remarkably good shape. This is a map of Italy. It shows where the city of Turin is located. And again, the shroud has been located there in a church, St. John's Cathedral, for the, over the last 400 years. This is a little closer look at the same map, pointing at, in Italian, Torino, for us in English, Turin. St. John's Cathedral. If we were to find the shroud tonight, we would go here. And under this dome, in the back here, there's a special chapel that was built to house the shroud. This is the chapel. I'm, again, sometimes I think I'm 52 going on seven, but when I show this to kids, sometimes I say, here's Father Mike going up the st And actually, this is a double altar structure here and here. Between the two and above it, there's kind of this rectangular structure. That is actually iron bars, and then within that, there's another row of iron bars, and within that, there's a large wooden box. Inside the box, there's an iron box. Inside the iron box, there's a silver box. And inside that, and wrapped in red silk, is the cloth we call the Shroud of Turin. If we were to go to there, uh, to Turin this evening, this is all we would see. So in a sense, by way of photographs, we're going to see more than if we were in front of it ourselves. This is a, a closer look at the iron bars and the outer box within. The next slide is a, a graph I try to draw to show very crudely some of the known history of the cloth. Here we have Jesus when he was alive in the Holy Land and the reference to the cloth that was on and around his body in the, in the Gospels. Now the question is obvious, can we trace this cloth to 1995, um, and that's the question. We trace a, the shroud from the time of now in the city of Turin back through the centuries to the year 1352 or 1355, or roughly in that period. But there, the record stops. And again, I want to be very honest and very balanced and objective with you. We do not have an unbroken record of Jesus' shroud from today to the tomb. If we did, there would be no question about its authenticity. There was something in Constantinople that sounds like it was a shroud, something that was in Edessa that we think might have been the shroud, a reference to something in Jerusalem, but we cannot tie the whole story together. So you have to understand the history at best is incomplete. Now the next slide is a painting that shows how Jesus would have been buried. A lot of times people think of shroud and they think wrapped like a mummy. Now this is a, next slide is just a closer look. If you can just think of a long cloth about 14 feet long placed on a flat surface and then Jesus' body was just placed on top of it. And then the extra half was just placed over his body. It's almost certain that Jesus was buried in a hurry on Good Friday, perhaps before they had a chance to wash his body 
and that's why the women were coming back on Easter Sunday to finish the process. But blood and sweat and other body fluids would leave some kind of an impression across the back. And this part would rest on his face and chest and arms and leave a, another image of the front on the underside as we would see it here. So if you took this cloth and just opened it up, you'd have an image here and it would meet another image, a facial image, a, a, a front image that would seem to meet it in the center. So we actually have two impressions of the same man. The question really is, what's his name? Now the next slide, I believe, is one of those rare moments where the cloth was taken out for public display. It's a very rare event. This, I think, was taken in 1930. The shroud was taken out, put in a huge frame, put above an altar for public display. And what I want you to look at is that the cloth was burned. And you can see two long marks across the whole length of the cloth, uh, scorch marks, almost like railroad tracks. I'd like you to look, though, between those two lines and see if you can see that dim, blurry image of what may be, um, what may be Jesus. Now, this is not easy to make out, but I hope if I can point out some of the details, you'll see it. Here again is the frame. And these two lines are the scorch marks that go the whole length of the cloth. These rectangular, or rectangular, triangular structures here, 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 and here, those are holes that were later patched by that fire that happened in 1532. <clears throat> but what I want you to look for is not the burn marks, but between them. This is actually a bloody footprint. The back of his legs, back, shoulders, back of his head. Here, face, chest, the arms, and his legs. Can you make that loud a little bit now? Okay. The next slide is much closer, much clearer. It shows just the front image as if he were standing and facing us. <clears throat> and I'm going to ask you if you can look and even see the marks where the nail went through. His face, shoulders, chest, crossed arms. This is a nail wound. Chemically, it has been tested and it has been confirmed to be real blood and chemically it's human. Here is a, is a patch as part of the burned part of the fire. But this area right here that I'm trying to circle, that is blood. This man was speared right here and out of his chest came a watery, bloody fluid. The next slide is the whole cloth that shows footprint all the way down. And now just to look at the hands. There is a whole, there are volumes of medical details that are apparently here. I'm not an expert enough to be able to report on most of it. <clears throat> but one of the things that's most obvious is that the nail wound is not in the palm of the hand, but in the wrist area. And this confirms uh, what doctors suspected for years was that the way the artists have drawn the crucifixion was medically inaccurate, that the weight of a body would just simply not allow a palm wound. It would just simply pull through. That when the Romans crucified, they actually put the wound, or the nail rather, through the wrist. 
There are no thumbs visible. This may seem a little gruesome, but a, a French doctor, <coughs> Pierre Barbet, did some experiments on amputated arms um, and found that a, a, a hand or a wrist that was nailed, uh, even if the person was amputated and the arm was dead, in fact, the wrist wound would cause the thumb to snap across the palm, uh, a nerve reaction. And then when you have the hand facing away from you, you would not see the thumbs. Everywhere doctors have looked, they have found perfect conformity to what they would know would be authentic human physiology. This is just a super close look at the wrist wound. And now, his face. Oh, I'm sorry, this is the flagrum. I misspoke. This is the, the whip, the Roman whip that would have been used on Jesus. And you can see the, the double weights, and they would leave the barbell-like wounds on his back. And the next slide is a picture of his back. You have to think of this as looking up from underneath him as he was on the cloth. Here's where his head rested, and this is blood that came out of his scalp from the crown of thorns. His shoulders are here. This is blood that came pooling down from his wound in his side and then trickled across the back in the tomb. But the rest of this are whip marks, and they do go all the way down to his ankles. And if you look carefully, you can see the signature that says this is a Roman whip, the double wound. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. I read once where someone had counted that there are over 120 wounds like this on him. And now his face. What I've shown you so far, again, is what I would be able to show you if I had the cloth here myself and we could just open it up and, and, and see it with our eyes. But one of the most extraordinary things about the shroud is something you can't see with your eyes. In 1898, a man named Secundo Pia was given permission to take a photograph of the shroud for the first time. He took the plate home, developed it, held up the negative and almost fainted. He discovered something that no one had realized until then, that the shroud, as you see it with your eyes, is shaded, lights and darks, just like a photographic negative. In other words, if you were to see a real picture of a real person, the parts of the body that would be lighter in shading, like the forehead, cheeks, nose, and the shroud, they're darker. The eye socket, <clears throat> which normally would be a little recessed, a little bit more in shadow, a little darker. In the shroud, the eyes are lighter. Now I'll show you this again. It makes sense, if you think about it, as a very natural occurrence. The nose, the cheeks, the forehead, would touch the cloth more or come closer than the recessed areas. So what we see is a perfectly reasonable, natural phenomenon. But it's not the way our eyes normally see a person. It's reversed. Secundo Pia looked at his negative, and negatives did what negatives always do. They reversed lights and darks. And what it had done is reverse this image into light darks that we would expect in a normal picture, a normal photograph. I've heard it said that Secundo Pia discovered that the shroud may be a 2,000-year-old photograph that was waiting until our time to be developed. 
And what I want to show you is what may be Jesus showing himself to our time. This is simply a reminder picture. This is what your eyes see with the cloth unrolled before us. The next slide is a negative. It reverses lights and darks. The cloth will look black. The dark parts will be light. The blood stains will look light. Also, and this is just an incidental, lefts and rights are reversed. But beyond the technical stuff, could this be Jesus? I want you to see and decide if this could be the Lord showing himself to us. And now a close look at his face. Now some people say, well, okay, it's crucified and all that, but a lot of people were crucified. How do we know this is Jesus? And this is something I can't show you, but I'd like you to think about. If this were just an ordinary person and he had been placed in the cloth and left there, Within a short time, the body's decay would have not only destroyed the body, but the cloth as well, and certainly any image on it. A French agnostic scientist said, the only way we can explain the image being this sharp is that the body was in the cloth long enough to make the impression, but gone, so it would not destroy it gone within two or three days. If this man had just simply deteriorated or decayed in the cloth, we would not have a picture. Now also some people have said, Father, it's funny or remarkable how, many, how much this picture looks like the paintings we have of Jesus. The long hair, the beard, the mustache. And then someone said, I wonder if it's just the opposite. Maybe instead of our pictures, um, <clears throat> or the shroud looking like our pictures, perhaps our pictures look like a shroud. And that in ancient times people saw it, copied Jesus looking like this, long hair, beard, and mustache, and would develop a tradition of showing him like this. I'd like you to look at this. This is kind of hard to see, but bear with me. This is a wrinkle. This is a wrinkle. This is a water stain. There are marks on the cloth that are just incidentals of no real consequence. <clears throat> now there is above his nose a structure that looks like a box or a square, but it is there, the box without a top. I'd like you to look now at a painting that was made probably about six or 700 AD. It's in a catacomb below Rome. It's a painting of Jesus, and it's on a wall. It's crumbling. It's really in terrible shape. But it is a painting of Jesus, and I'd like you to look and see if perhaps someone who painted Jesus saw this and was copying. Now there are a few things I guess I'd like you to notice on this. Uh, see the square? See the stain across his forehead here? And his nostril on this side is more prominent, more swollen. The next slide is uh, just the face as you see it uh, with your naked eye. Notice the stain, the box, and this nostril 
seems to be swollen or more prominent than the other. There are many other paintings. This happens to be just one. That seem to show a connection to Jesus and the shroud. And this cloth, or this painting, is far, far older than the uh, carbon dating would seem to indicate. Another bit of evidence that the carbon dating is inaccurate. Again, I don't want to tell you what to believe. I'm not here tonight to push or sell or uh, to put anyone in a position where I'm asking for an affirmative decision. All I can do is tell you this. I believe that about 600 years A.D., when the man or woman who was painting this was trying to paint Jesus, he was remembering and trying to copy this. Would he love you enough tonight to appear to you and say, be not afraid, I am with you always. I said I'd be finished before eight, we've got five minutes now. <clears throat> there are a lot of things more that I could say, but I don't want to just dump on you. One is in my mind, so I'll say it. Um, there is a, 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 excuse me, a Swiss forensic criminologist who did a lot of his um, work in a police lab basing his discovery of pollen and how it would ev show evidence of where a person was because of pollen marks on their clothing. He took some regular scotch tape, put it on the shroud, took his tape home, examined it under a microscope, and found pollen from a lot of different plants. Many of the plants were from Italy, which is understandable, that's where it is, and from France, that's where it is, or was. That French, or oh, excuse me, that fire was in, a, in France. But a lot of the pollen, in fact, two-thirds of the pollen, comes from the Middle East. From Constantinople, where there was a reference to a cloth in a special royal chapel that was supposed to be the Shroud of Jesus. And there was also shroud or pollen on it from a area of central Turkey, where there was a town called Odessa, where there was a cloth that was extraordinarily famous in the first hundred centuries, of, well, first, let's say half of the first millennium. They said, we have an image of Jesus, not made by hands. It's uh, called the image of Odessa, they have pollen from that area on the shroud. There's also pollen on the shroud from plants that grow almost exclusively around Jerusalem. We don't have an unbroken chain of evidence of history and say, here it was, here it was, here it was. But there are some powerful pieces of evidence that suggest that the shroud, even though it was known to be in Europe from 1352 on, most of its story apparently was somewhere else because there's more pollen on it from the Middle East than there is from Europe. Okay. The problem that I can see for myself is you can get buried in details. Pile up this, this, and this, and this, and this. Um, I like to think of the Shroud as the Eighth Sacrament. The old definition, visible sin, sign instituted by Christ to give grace, catechism, lesson from the kids. Is this from Jesus? Is it to help us love him? Is it to help 
us know he loves us. That's what this is about. All the things about spectrums and carbon-14 and evaluation of the blood fluorescing, that's interesting and important, but not as important as, could this be Jesus asking you to trust him and feel his love in your lives? I began this saying this is a shroud talk. I hope you go home and say we really didn't see a shroud talk. We had a Jesus talk. And the shroud is just a window to our hearts that lets the sun shine in. Okay? Amen. Thank you.